Thanks for your patience with the uh, technical setup here. So after that really rousing um, large large scale story um, from Huguet, we're gonna dig into some of the details. Um, as Tom said, my name is Porter McConnell and I'm the director of the Financial Transparency Coalition that Huguet um, referred to. If you're not familiar with the FTC, uh, and I recognize a lot of your faces, um, we are a global network of civil society and governments and experts. Um, and we advocate for a lot of the financial transparency measures that um, have been brought up already. Um, public registries of beneficial ownership, public country by country reporting, and automatic exchange of financial information with the general idea that uh, informed governments and informed citizens can be a really powerful antidote to an opaque financial system. I'd like to thank GFI for convening us for the launch of this important book. Much has been said already about GFI's contributions, especially to the early diagnosis of the problem, and for championing the issue before anyone was really listening. I will merely add to that my gratitude to them for co-founding the Financial Transparency Coalition in 2009 without which I wouldn't be here. This session is a conversation on government trade and balance of payments data, which is a major source for the illicit flows estimates in this book. The IMF's balance of payments data is used in GFI's analysis of net errors and omissions. And direction of trade statistics are used to identify discrepancies in reports between two trading partners. Together with other sources, they tell a story of the gaps the undocumented, the unknown in global trade. The data are not without their critics as a source for estimating illicit flows. Some argue that they're too conservative and fail to capture trade and intangibles like intellectual property. Others argue that they're too broad and capture economic activity that's not necessarily illicit. But because the one characteristic that all illicit cash shares is the desire to obscure its source, estimating the size of illicit flows however you do it is an exercise in frustration, as many of you will probably attest to. So why do we do it? There are two reasons in my mind. One, most of the credible estimates that are out there right now point to a substantial amount of money that's going missing from developing country economies, and that's money that could be put to good use. Two, and this to me is perhaps the more compelling reason, illicit financial flows exist in the shadows entirely outside the accountability compact between states and their citizens. It's not just undemocratic. The research suggests that this kind of asymmetry of information can be toxic to development. So that's why we're here, to try to understand the data. Our panelists are going to talk you through the numbers, why they matter, and their limitations. On to the experts. Dev Carr is chief economist at Global Financial Integrity. Prior to joining GFI, he was a senior economist at the IMF, and during his 32 years at the fund, Dr. Carr worked on a wide variety of macroeconomic and statistical issues, both at headquarters and on missions. Dr. Carr has a PhD in economics from the George Washington University, a master's in database management systems from Howard University, and an undergraduate degree in physics from the University of Calcutta. Dr. Carr has published a number of articles on macroeconomic and statistical issues. Anders Akersgaff heads the World Bank's Preventive Services Unit. As a lot of you may know, the unit was established in response to recommendations from the Independent Review Panel, which was chaired by former Federal Reserve Chair Paul Volcker. The unit identifies integrity risks to the World Bank's portfolio, provides consulting services to the bank's global practice areas on how to protect against fraud and corruption in the bank's investments, and builds capacity amongst national agencies. Dr. Akersgaff has previously served uh, at the World Bank's Board and Corporate Strategy Group, as well as at the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And last but certainly not least, Tamara Razin is a senior economist in the Balance of Payments Division in, of the Statistics Department at the IMF. She coordinated the Balance of Payments Compilation Guide that the IMF published in 2014, and she leads a team responsible for the Balance of Payments and International Investment Position Manual, also known as the BPM-6. She provides technical assistance and conducts training on statistics and is a member of the Reserve Asset Statistics team. Prior to the IMF, Ms. Razin was Deputy Chief of the Balance of Payments Division at the National Bank of Moldova for 13 years. So we'll go with Dev first. Thanks. Thank you, Porto. Uh, I'll start with a few general remarks on the importance of data. 
In my work as a chief economist at GFR, it's all about data. Uh, without data, I cannot make any case uh, for or against illicit flows. Uh, uh, why I say is that why I say that is because without data, one can make only assertions, but one cannot prove those assertions. The problem with illicit flows is that, first of all, it's a very difficult measure. Because it's illicit, it's very hard to observe. So the correct expression is measurable illicit flows. So when you're talking about data, you're obviously talking about measurable illicit flows. But measurable illicit flows is much less than total illicit flows. Because you cannot uh, get data on, for example, illicit flows generated due to drug trafficking, uh, due to human trafficking, uh, due to other kinds of illicit illegal activities. Now, when I came for the job interview at GFI, I was asked that uh, we, I have to do two projects and whether I could do it funded by the Ford Foundation. First project, estimate the volume of illicit flows coming out of developing countries. I said, yes, I could do that because methodology exists and I could come up with an estimate based on that methodology. The second pro project was, where is the money going? Okay. Where is it lodged? Obviously, if, you, if this is coming out from developing countries, it's going somewhere. I was not sure about the second project. <laughs> and I openly expressed my doubt. I said, well, Raymond, I'm not sure whether I can come up with that, with that, such an answer. Even the world's best economists haven't come up with that answer. And the reason is that of data, lack of data. Tax havens are not cooperating. Even banks are not cooperating. So one can talk about this and that. Oh, we think that it's going to the tax havens. You know, most of it is going to tax havens. A little is going to the banks. But one cannot talk about these things in any framework, using any framework. So, um, but in spite of that, I got hired. I, mean, I, guess my, I guess my answer was convincing. But I tried my best. And uh, we did come up some, with some estimates, uh, although we don't have hard data. Uh, I found out some way of uh, using BIS, the Bank for International Settlements data, was able to give some kind of a partial answer in spite of all big holes. Now, the IMF, uh, I, I worked for 13 years in the statistics department of the IMF. And Tamara, we, uh, my, my career towards the fag end overlapped a bit with, with Tamara's uh, stint there. Uh, and um, so uh, my, my, the, the basic point I'm making is the IMF is still the premier international organization responsible for compiling macroeconomic statistics. It compiles a whole range of statistics. The coverage is very large, going back many years. And the IMF has been basically my savior in the job that I'm doing at GFI. Without the IMF, I probably wouldn't be able to come up with the estimates that we come up with. Uh, a premier uh, publication, a flagship publication of the IMF is the direction of trade statistics, which is the crux of our uh, trade misinvoicing numbers. Now, the other... Um, piece of data that we use is the balance of payments uh, bottom line, which is the net errors and omissions. We take that as a proxy for illegal or illicit uh, financial flows out of the external accounts of a country. This has been done for years by economists, decades, as a proxy for illicit capital out of a country. Trade misinvoicing, of course, uh, relies not only on the trade that developing countries report to the IMF, but also the industrial countries that report the counterpart. So in other words, we compare the export and imports of developing countries versus the import and export of industrial countries from that developing country. Now, there have been some issues with regard to 
many African countries, they're not current, they have data gaps. So the way I have tried to come up with uh, filling those gaps is using the international financial statistics. It's not the, not the, uh, the uh, main way of, or the preferable way of doing things, but rather than have a zero there uh, and understating their illicit flows, I tried to use, I use uh, IFS data uh, to fill up the gaps from the DOTS. Um, so um, I just want like to, after having made the, this general uh, observations, uh, could we have the slide, the first slide? Um, the, um, I'll try to sort of uh, address um, some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, criticisms uh, that economists have made from time to time on this um, methodology of of uh, capital flight. Economists uh, talk about capital flight and not so much on illicit flows because capital flight is a more traditional term. They have not been able to come out of it. We are now pushing the envelope. We are putting this uh, issue of illicit flows on the table, but economists are still hung up on capital flight. And the capital flight, the reason why we moved away from capital flight into illicit flows is because capital flight connotes that the problem lies with the developing countries. It is their problem over there. It's macroeconomic instability, governance problems, whatever. They need to fix it. It absolves the industrial countries who are playing, who are, who are absorbing this, these flows, basically. These flows basically end up in industrial countries. So illicit flows give the give the connotation, clear connotation, the implication is there are flows coming out and is being absorbed in industrial countries. So the, the economists, there's a group of economists who do not use the trade misinvoicing. They say there are too many issues with trade data. And they basically focus on balance of payments. Now we have reached a stage where we put the issue on the table and we have been able to we are successful in that, so we have gone past that. But there are still hangouts there in, among the economists because they have, they have uh, done this work for years, for 30, 40 years, and they have taken this entrenched position. It's very hard to get back to. But I just want to briefly address the lack of, uh, there's no logic to this uh, as to why they exclude uh, trade misinvoicing because on the guys that, oh, they have errors in compilation. Well, that doesn't hold water. See, so if you look at the basic, uh, this is the basic identity in Econ 101. Uh, this is the first class that anyone takes in economics. And uh, where GDP is just a, a summation of uh, the different sectors, consumption, investment, government, and net exports. If you have a problem with net exports, that's only one component of GDP. There are errors in every other component as well. Errors in measurement of consumption, which consists of private consumption and government consumption. Private consumption is typically measured from household service, which have margins of error. The investment consists of private investment and government investment. Private investment, again, is based on service, so there are margins of error. And uh, the government, of course, government is still there, but it doesn't have that much errors. But this is, in other words, the short, long and short of it is that errors due to uh, uh, trade is just a component of other areas, and yet the whole world talks about GDP. There's no discussion in economics without GDP. The IMF is following GDP numbers with the microscope. And uh, the World Economic Outlook, every three months comes up with updates of GDP growth around the world. So that doesn't hold water. Uh, you know, just that, you know, we, we, we should not look at trade because the trade misunderstanding has numbers. That doesn't, uh, it doesn't, have, you know. Can we have the next slide? Now, the, the other um, point I'd like to mention is statistical errors in the compilation of trade statistics. Uh, the fund produces an annual report uh, called the uh, annual current account discrepancy. Uh, basically, the, um, the, the thesis is here is very simple. The IMF comes up with a measure of statistical errors. And how does it define statistical errors? Well, at the global level, Exports must equal imports. It cannot go to the moon. Whatever countries are exporting, it must be 
exported, imported by other countries. Now, this is an advantage in trade that is not afforded in any other branch of statistics, or in most other branch of statistics. National accounts is open-ended. You don't know what the margins of error are. Trade, you have a boundary condition. This is the luxury, luxury item. You don't have it anywhere else, at least I'm, that I'm not familiar with. So <clears throat> the IMF uses this and comes up with a measure of statistical errors. The average is 0.8% of gross goods trade, export plus imports. So export minus imports over export plus imports is about 0.8% for the last 10 years. Now, <clears throat> compared to that, if you're looking at the trade misinvoicing of some large developing countries, interesting developing countries, let's put it this way. I just took some uh, developing countries, like four developing, Ghana, Nigeria, China, India, and then I also cite the US numbers. You can see that the average is much higher than 0.8%. You've got 23.8% for Ghana, you've got nearly 11% for Nigeria, 8%, around 8% for China, and 7.6% for India. Obviously, something is going on. Trade, the statistical errors cannot explain these kind of large errors. For US, it is like 4%, okay? So, um, <clears throat> basically, so I just established the point that uh, statistical uh, data are very important, and high quality data are very important. And the IMF is uh, contributing uh, to making uh, high, I mean, to, to ensuring that countries follow the guidelines that it issues on the compilation of uh, various data, national accounts, trade, uh, and uh, it provides technical assistance to member countries uh, to ensure that the uh, data quality is high and current at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raymond and Tom, for inviting me to speak today. I started working on integrity issues about eight years ago, and the first thing I recognize is, is it's very difficult to explain to people that don't work in the crime field. So, for example, in the World Bank, we do investments all over the world, and I have to talk to people that are responsible for these investments about fraud and corruption, and they don't immediately connect all of them. So what is the problem? Well, if we look at a crime like a homicide, somebody's shot twice in the back, he has been tied, it's on the floor, there's blood, everybody will agree there's a murder, right? Whereas economic crimes, people don't agree. So my job in a prevention unit is to create a murder. I have to say there's a problem. <laughs> look, the numbers are really bad, and you have to do something about it. So. As a consultant within the World Bank, my job is to create problems. <laughs> <clears throat> That's why we're so popular. <laughs> so coming to this field, I, I was thinking back at uh, the time I worked at the, at the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I was, as a junior official, in charge of putting together the briefings for the ministers traveling on trade missions. And I would um, make these briefings more efficient and, and less paper. So why produce both an import and export statistic for the same country? I mean, it's almost always the same, except that only worked on countries like when the minister's going to Europe and so on. But then the minister traveled to Africa, and the statistics didn't match. I had the luxury of choosing the number I liked, because why would I send two numbers up? Then the minister m might say, this net up, and I had to find out what to do with it, right? So I just sent the largest number up, because it looked we had good relations. Well, obviously things are different now. so. Next slide. So I, I tried to look at the, um, the trade issue, the trade uh, misinvoicing and, and Dev's data work and reflect a little bit on it given the World Bank's work. A few years ago I was asked to, to uh, look at illegal locking in an African country and the bank, World Bank had suggested that they have a, an export tax because they couldn't really control the movement of locks and so on. So it would be easier at a port uh, SGS had been hired 
to tally it up and collect the taxes and so on. But still, some logs kind of found a way outside the country. So first question is, um, will data statistics be able to reconcile, say, how logs are counted on the production side with the trade statistics? Right? So if you can start doing this around the world, maybe that would be helpful. Right? The second thing um, I came across was a recent article in uh, The Independent saying that Swiss companies bought a lot of gold from Togo, except that Togo is not a gold producer, really. All right, so what is going on? And, and how, how do we deal with these data issues? Is there a way to, to figure out data-wise that maybe it came from a neighboring country? Right? To, to, to say, you know, maybe it came from Burkina Faso. Um, the, sec the second thing is beyond evading uh, export duties, which can happen in a number of ways, is of course import duties. We had a recent investigation the World Bank. Again, there's no rocket science. Company lied about the number of items being imported and the value of the items. And uh, we were pursuing the matter, but the World Bank cannot sanction companies for tax evasion. I thought we could. So we have an internal challenge. How do we deal with this uh, issue? The third one, uh, the third possible criminal explanation for the differences in, in the trade statistics are, of course, that people just steal the resources and move them outside the country, and they don't want to report these things in official statistics. Interestingly enough, talking to a retired uh, director from the IRS Criminal Investigation Division, the stories about uh, transfer pricing, there is no criminal side to this. <coughs> so I asked, so have you had any criminal convictions of, of uh, transfer mispricing? And she said no. Okay, there may be some examples out here, John, and maybe others can, can point to it, but it's very interesting that we have not been able to criminalize that side. I put in as a footnote some excellent work by colleagues uh, of mine, uh, Rikers, showing that when you have kleptocracies, companies can actually be powerful enough to go in and change the tariff structure. Again, that is not behind any of the data we are talking about today, but I thought it was an interesting um, observation. So what we are doing in my unit right now is trying to get a sense of all of the various schemes that are coming out on the tax side, because we hear all of these anecdotal examples, but we don't really know what is the extent, what is the taxonomy, and so on. Next slide. Not trying to compete with Dev or anybody else on data, I wouldn't do very well. I tried to look at what are some policy implications of what you guys are talking about. So the first thing I thought about was policy coherence. So obviously this is not just a developing country problem, but also one for developed countries. So why not create coherence between a development policy of an OECD country and its, say, custom services? Again, very specifically, can the US or my country, Denmark, live with the fact that we import a lot of stuff from a country, but it's not in the export statistics? Is that sufficient grounds, for example, to do a proactive investigation? Again, I asked that of, of uh, the former IRS colleague, and she said, yes, I'm not quite so sure. But at least do or should custom revenue agencies have a risk-based approach to going in and looking at these things? Right? It could be data analytics, but even your numbers, Raven and, and Dev, could they form a basis for looking at, okay, we need to look at oil from this country, gold from that country, whatever. Just, just a broad one. And then these countries can dig in and, and be more detailed. For example, uh, just applying a little bit of data analysis, uh, we produced a checklist to identify fraudulent bids. This is in procurement. And we tested it on past investigation it was 59% effective in identifying fraud and collusion. So what would the similar tool look like in customs, right? Similarly, we use data analysis to identify the highest risk bank projects. We put in the top 20. 19 of the 20 are now under investigation, right? We, have, we brought in data scientists to find out, can we predict the complaints that are more likely to result in a substantiated investigation. Again, bring that into customs and elsewhere. Let's try to make data analysis work. The second thing um, I, I think we need to consider is criminalizing certain practices. Okay, We've criminalized bribery, fine, but it can be hard to prove. So 
lawyers figured out, well, maybe we need to do something about conflicts of interest. So with conflict of interest, I don't need to show that somebody did something bad and took a bribe. I just have to say there's a conflict of interest. So what does it look like in the country of illicit financial flows? I know this is an abstract question, but think about it. The third thing I thought was interesting is the Leahy Act, basically prohibiting um, the uh, import of um, uh, items like logs that have been uh, taken in violation of national laws. I think we need to think about that. I think we need to think about the uh, disclosure requirements. So if companies are relying on materials that are a high likelihood of ending up on devs list, should they disclose? I mean, why it's just conflict minerals and, you know, well, there must be other things as well. Moving on, transparency and enforcement in developing countries. Obviously, we need to support law enforcement in these countries, and we know it's hard. It's not just hard to finance, but also for them to operate independently. Uh, a year ago, we invited organizations from more than 130 countries to the World Bank, law enforcement officials and what have you, and we surveyed them. More than two-thirds said that they experienced political interference. So are they really allowed to do this kind of work? Well, luckily, some of them hooked up, like uh, we had um, one African nation that hooked up with the Swiss, so the Swiss could pursue that case that they could not in their country. So some of these kind of networking opportunities can allow for a case to pursue, uh, be pursued elsewhere. Also important is working across law enforcement agencies. So right now, my unit is working with Scandinavian tax authorities to come up with a crime threat assessment uh, toolkit. The idea is that maybe other enforcement uh, arms know something that the customs officials should know about. Right? So how do we share intelligence? Because different agencies have different tools. And I know, for example, from Eric Hilton, who is the uh, executive director of the uh, IRS Criminal Investigation Division, that the US does not have a threat assessment that is comprehensive in the sense that it builds on other agencies. So is there anything we can do there that brings in this kind of analysis? Something the World Bank and other financial institutions could do, and also development institutions, is to start comparing procurement data with customs data. Or it could also happen in developing countries. So we finance let's say, a 1,000 computers that cost whatever. That is the price that has been charged the government. What do the, the, the customs declarations say? Has anybody ever really gone in and matched these things? Right? I mean, we have a potential entry point as an international development institution, but other institutions could do the same. Next slide. On the company side, there is some discussion ongoing, but not very positive, about taking the tax evasion side into corporate social responsibility. Maybe one way to think about it, we all saw the pictures of the textile factory that had collapsed and all of the people that were killed in Bangladesh. Right? Corruption was behind that. Corruption allowed these conditions to, to be accepted. But ask the other question, do we put corrupted fuel on our vehicles? Would that be okay? Are there other things that we buy as consumers we should not accept buying? What will it look like? Right? So that is a discussion that needs to be taken back to the private sector as they go back and look at the supply chains. The last three points. I met with Cesar Purisima, who is the Secretary of Finance from Philippines uh, back in spring 2014, and he suggested global tax identification numbers. Basically, trade flows should not be anonymous. I think it's a really great idea. Maybe some people that are more expert than me will say, well, there are all of these issues. But think about it. If you always know who owns some goods, and you would then take the tax identification number and the country code, and you can see it all over the world. And the problem is with reconciling data is you don't have identical numbers. It's not like accounting where you can look at how much went into to your bank account and how much did you actually spend. I mean, there's no way to do this, really. Right? You just need to kind of add up and see this match. So 
do we need that kind of, of identification numbers to do real reconciliation? Um, we talked about the heat maps. I think this is really key. Which you, you brought the up that about where are the ma uh, major discrepancies. And maybe lastly, bring in maybe the maritime bodies. They have a lot of information as well. They've established a, the maritime anti-corruption network. Could we go in and look at what, they, what data they have on the movement of containers and so on to, to make more robust analysis? I know one researcher has suggested that, but I'm not as much into the details to say what kind of uh, fields would be available if you were to, to compile the two databases. Anyway, those were some thoughts from, from my side. I have some colleagues from the Financial Market Integrity Unit, Stolen Asset Recovery, if it's really hard questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for inviting me to take uh, participate in such a forum. Uh, coming from a practical uh, point of view, so it for me is uh, really difficult to fit my practical skills into your uh, civil society discussions. But I will try to to bring a little bit of clarity what we are compiling, what we are doing, which data we are compiling, and how they can use be used in in, in uh, the analysis. Uh, so measuring illicit flows, it's, it's a really very difficult task <laughs> because they're illicit. Uh, and uh, as Dev uh, stated, IMF has a leading role in developing the methodology for uh, collecting and compiling uh, statistics on all uh, cross-border movements. And uh, these statistics are called external sector statistics. And they include a range of data sets, which is balance of payments, is international investment position, and another databases. And they are also compiling and maintaining different databases. One of it is this direction of trade statistics, which is uh, one of the topics of discussions very often today. And we have a range of other data sets like uh, in direct investment uh, data set of statistics. And uh, so how do we collect and compile this? The IMF is a leader in developing methodology. We are uh, entitled with the uh, ownership of uh, uh, developing the manuals in uh, compiling balance of payments and external sector statistics. And we are trying to, to have all member countries to apply the same methodology. Because when you analyze something on the international level, on the global level, you should have something consistent. You cannot have a country saying that this is an apple and another country saying this is a peach. So if you compare different states, you will have uh, no, no uh, different results. So that's why our task is to have countries to apply the same methodology, the same approach, the same classification approach, to have more or less uh, consistent and comparable statistics. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a simple task, and uh, uh, countries are different with different capacity, with different resources to produce uh, some uh, reliable data and to come with some reliable data sets. Uh, in the compilers, how to capture illicit uh, flows? Our manuals state that all flows have to be captured, illegal, legal, and so on. But this is what manual says. To implement this into practice, could you imagine how a compiler can capture uh, drugs, uh, trade in drugs, or how a compiler can capture other, uh, I don't know, illicit, uh, illegal, illegal flows? It's it's really difficult. They are doing their best. Sometimes compilers are left alone to to to, to have this battle with uh, for for good data, because they don't always have support of their uh, of their policymakers. Uh, so. Uh, we are advising and we are doing sometimes, I was a compiler for many years and I sometimes I was calling myself self as a detective because you have to find a way to contact somebody to give you data and to find a way to collect some pieces of information to be able to put together an estimate of something. So they are using official data, they are using data from official sources, they are using ad hoc uh, surveys, let's say on remittances or something. Sometimes even they are conducting some surveys uh, approaching their friends and relatives. I, myself 
myself we were doing uh, estimating because I'm coming from Moldova where remittances flows are huge in, in GDP ratio. And I was uh, developing an estimation method in, uh, back ho home. And I was, we were asking our friends, our relatives, our family who was working abroad, what you are doing, how much you are bringing in pockets. So this is, uh, sometimes you have to be very inventive to f come to some, to some uh, figures. And when we moved from an uh, old method of estimation and we came instead of 100 million a year, after all this new method became to 400 million a year of remittances, this was a huge, huge uh, change, and we needed to, to prepare our users to understand what is happening. So, but it was accepted because we had some basics and some logics in this. Uh, this is how we, are, we have to work. And talking about uh, different fields, today it was mentioned these multinationals, and especially uh, those who are extracting resources. This is the biggest headache of our co uh, compilers. Recently, I returned from a country where, uh, of course, because they are put above the law, they are not, uh, don't have any uh, uh, statistical requir requirements for statistical reporting. And they, are above, uh, they don't pay any taxes in some cases uh, in a country. And sometimes they don't have, compilers don't have support of, of the authorities. Recently I returned from a country where, which is oil producing country where the co for the compilation of our statistics, there were three people only. In the country which huge, huge uh, flows, inflows, outflows of, of resources. And only they were happy, lucky that recently a crisis happened there. They had a huge depreciation of their uh, of, uh, uh, currency and so on. And the central, the governor of the central bank started asking every day about the balance of payments, what is happening in trade, what is happening with flows of, of currency. And Immediately, all those open. I came there, and it was a legal uh, uh, document uh, issued, uh, which was under discussion for eight years. After eight years, this uh, this uh, crisis happened, and it was approved, and they had the right to request data from from all these uh, uh, companies and so which helped but not in all not all countries are so so lucky in many many countries compilers uh, stay with one two people and uh, trying to deal with what uh, are called data sources so this is just a story how we are trying to to have more or less reliable sources from different countries because unfortunately we have not only developed countries with huge uh, with good resources and statistics we have countries where uh, resources are limited at the a minimum. So uh, what we have in, in, uh, uh, in what we are compiling and how to use those data sets. Our advice and our, uh, as a compiler, believe me, uh, with a huge experience in the compilation, there is no ideal data source where illicit flows sh should be measured and from where should be deducted, extracted. Because every single data set, every single statistics is, is, is built and is designed to fit some purposes. Balance of payments is designed to fit the purpose to capture all flows. And it captures legal, illegal, and so on. Direction of trade statistics is, is fit to, 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 to uh, fit the, and the pr purpose of international merchandise trade statistics. Even between the, we have the same uh, indicator to measure goods and in both uh, statistics, in balance of payments and in, in do uh, direct of trade statistics or international merchandise trade statistics, they differ among them because there are different concepts they're consistent, but, but in some, at some uh, point, there are some uh, different uh, approaches. Let's say goods for processing. Goods for processing is one of the uh, main uh, drug countries which are processing a lot of goods, just bringing raw material, processing the same oil, they're refining it and exporting, uh, exporting the, the uh, final product. In many cases, these uh, raw products are imported just without change of ownership. They are owned by, by original owner and their country provides just processing, processing uh, uh, services. And here there is a biggest difference between uh, direction of trade statistics because uh, in, in that statistics, export and import of this uh, raw material for processing and export after processing is included in goods as an ordinary import and export of goods. In balance of payments, because the payment actually for this processing is done just for the processing fee, not for the goods, because goods are not bought by this. In balance of payments, they capture just the 
cost of processing. And you will not find these flows of import of export of goods in the, in the, in the goods in balance of payments. That's why comparing dots as called, and, and goods in BOP and taking the difference between them as illicit flows, it's not correct because you will have flows which will not uh, reflect really illicit flows. So that's why you, it's practically impossible to deduct illicit flows comparing macroeconomic data, macroeconomic data sets. To do so, you have to go to micro data. You have to go to countries. You have to uh, data, go to data by country, sometimes even by uh, type of commodities, by type of activity, and so on. It's a huge work. It's a very difficult work. Taking even this of short centers, another case, but again, if there is willingness of, of the authorities to do so, you can, you can get good results. In another country, my practice, I was a center of offshore center where it's a huge center compared with the population of the, that island. And it was, for me, I was working in that country for, for five years. And at the five, fifth year, we succeeded to, to impose a reporting by offshore companies, but those which were not, uh, not reporting un until that time at all. So it was because the, uh, the uh, uh, policy makers decided to take this decision and to have these statistics. If there is no support of those uh, policy makers, you cannot have good statistics. And if there are no good statistics, you cannot take real and, and, and good decisions. So this is like a circle. And that's why it's very important to have the civil society to, 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 to support uh, the countries and to support to, to make policy makers understand that uh, they have to give more resources to provide statistics. Uh, I think I maybe I didn't answer your question, but we can, if you have questions, I can <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all of you, for uh, complimentary and fascinating presentations. I guess I want to piggyback off of the last thing that Tamara said. Um, you need the support of policymakers to collect good stats, and good stats lead to good decisions. Um, imagine that you were king or queen for the day. Um, what would be the data that you would most want access to? Um, the existing data source or the source that, you know, as, as my colleague put it, um, there's the data that's available, the data that, collect, that is collected but not available, at least to the public, and the data that is not collected but could be. So is there something, if you had to say, you know, maybe Dev in your work, what, what do you not get that you want? Well, uh, <clears throat> what we now have is basically misinvoicing involving goods. And that is a huge part of the measurable illicit flows. That is like 75 to 80% of illicit flows that is measurable. Now, this uh, DOTS-based misinvoicing has been used for decades by economists. They don't compare DOTS with BOP. With BOP. They compare DOTS within itself. And that has been the, the benchmark of studies on capital flight slash illicit flows for the last 50, 60 years, starting with Bhagwati in 1960s. So that is an established. But the, the problem is that it is only misinvoicing related to goods trade. It is not misinvoicing related to services trade. So we are losing a huge area of uh, you know uh, statistics where we could considerably come up with better estimate of illicit flows but we're not able to do that because services trade on a bilateral basis is not available for most developing countries most developed countries have it OECD has started this uh, database they have it but developing countries it's not so one of the things that I wanted when we have taken this up with the Statistics Department of the IMF, we met with them a couple of months ago, and we pressed our case that the IMF should collect, start a database on, along the lines of the DOTS, involving services trade. But of course, there is this, you know, different, industri uh, different international organizations have different focus and different tufts that they have, uh, and it is easier said than done to, uh, you know, uh, we were told that for the IMF to start, the IMF cannot unilaterally decide that we are going to start collecting 
data. It needs the support of other, uh, other international organizations like United Nations, UNCTAD, and so forth. So there is, there is some administrative um, sort of obstacles to overcome. But that would be a very helpful area. That's one area. And the second area where the IMF can uh, make improvement, and that is um, suggest that countries, through the customs invoices, clearly identify transactions within related parties. You see, all that they need is just a check mark whether a particular export or import involves related parties. So that would give you a very solid information using existing collection methods, because existing customs invoices, to collect real hard data on MNC trade, multinational trade. Right now, everybody is talking in a nebulous term. Oh, it could be 70%, it could be 50%. Nobody really knows about the hard numbers, you know. We need to talk about numbers and not conjecture and not uh, assumptions and so forth. And there are, and, and in the vacuum that we are operating in, people are coming with all kinds of numbers, you know. But these numbers are not based on data. But this can be fixed relatively easily if customs were to just collect the information and ask every company, is this transaction involving related parties or not? Then the company should be able to answer that question. And I don't think this will be a huge burden on, on uh, the trading partners to answer that question. Great. Anybody else want to take up that, that challenge? I think if I would be a king or, or a country, first of all, I would be interested in those data which are not collected and not known. Because <laughs> what is known, what is collected, I know what is there. What is collected and not public, <laughs> I also can have access. But sometimes in those unknown flows could be so much danger, could be so much hidden that would, you never know how it can turn against your country. Spoken like a true detective. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then Anderson's job is to create murders. <laughs> <They're just> yes. He's <laughs> starting to sense a theme. OK. Um, one more question for me, and then I'd like to open up to, uh, to you folks. Um, I guess one of, the, one of the questions I have, we were talking about kind of, um, uh, Anders, you mentioned that you know the bank can't really sanction companies for tax evasion. You know, what do we do? Um, how do we get creative around this problem? Um, and the difficulty of criminalizing transfer pricing, um, even the IRS hasn't been able to. Um, I guess my question, uh, coming from the, the, the advocacy world, right now, this fall, uh, the European Union is gearing up for a big debate on public country by country reporting. Um, for all sectors, not just for uh, logging and extractives and banking. So I guess my question is um, to you, if you could use your crystal ball, will it help? Is that, a, is that a step that could be useful? I think so. Um, I think it's moving the debate from the more theoretical general principle based into something that would lead to uh, companies and others taking very specific steps in one direction or another. Um, I think the creativity of, for example, the Philippines, you know, they went out and bought newspaper space. They uh, then published the major importers, how much they imported for, and how much they paid in customs. So there was one in tobacco that imported a lot but hardly paid any customs. So uh, the day after they got a phone call from this company, they wanted to talk, right? So, so this is a variation of, you know, if you do country by country reporting, whatever, I mean, what can come up when you make things public? So I think you need to be very creative. And going back to your first question, you know, what can we do right now on the data side? I think one is improving the data. The other one is taking action on the data, right? So um, again, I'm not a customs official. I don't have that experience. But I was just thinking, you probably have a list of companies that are importing or exporting that, that you find suspicious, right? And we, we did the same thing at the World Bank. Uh, companies were already investigating that if you had a lot of complaints about or other risk information. And maybe you could do something similar. Or I heard in one country, they organized private sector and say, OK, write down the, on, on a piece of paper your most corrupt competitor, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So there's, there's a way to figure it out. Or I, I talked to a friend of mine in the consulting industry exactly about that and say, what are the three most corrupt competitors? He named three companies. I shouldn't mention them here. And I talked to a head of investigation, the same three companies. So people know in certain areas, right? So highlight these entities you're going to go after, right? Be, be more data-driven, right? And, and, and publish the results 
try to show how much money you're recuperating of other, other things you're getting out of that to get more popular support for the enforcement side, right? It also goes back to the data side. If you didn't have the basic statistics, you couldn't uh, buy the, the space uh, in the newspapers. So I think data needs to be also advocacy driven and it needs to drive the proactive reviews, right? So somebody needs to go in a very detailed way and say, what pieces of information can help me with what? And then take it back. Of course, you also have a global data discussion, but that, that's a different one. Great, that's helpful. I'm going to open it up to the floor now. Um, be sure when you ask your question to let us know where you're coming from and your name. Um, my name is Tolu Animi Shego. I'm a Nigerian from Nigeria, but I study at Penn State. Um, so please permit me. I take this issue very personally because it affects my country. Permit me a short diatribe on the issue. I would have liked to actually say this after Dr. Um, LaBelle's presentation because it, it uh, pertains more to what she said. But let me just go in anyway. So um, when the um, AU ECA high level panel report came out, there were actually a number of responses, constructive responses from African civil society organizations. <clears throat> uh, for example, the CSO I work with back home was able to get funding from Trust Africa, which is uh, a formerly a branch of uh, the MacArthur Mark Foundation, to actually produce the first uh, um, country-level report on illicit financial flows, um, and that would have been that is the Nigerian report. The problem for me is these responses have been largely uncoordinated. So. Um, uh, the second issue that was immediately apparent was that developing countries lack the capacity to deal with domestic resource mobilization issues. Um, country by country reporting, <coughs> or for example, the accelerate, I don't know if anyone has heard of the accelerated payments notification that the UK is currently um, using and has been notoriously effective in dealing with tax avoidance. Um, such initiatives will not be palatable in a developing country such as Nigeria because our tax system is just not sophistic sophisticated enough to, to execute such initiatives. <clears throat> um, which brings me back to the issue of lack of coordination. Uh, earlier this year, there was the introduction of um, this initiative, Tax Investigators Without Borders. And I had hoped that there would be, you know, this overwhelming global support because um, there are aim is to help uh, tax officials in developing countries be able to catch up and be able to come to conversations like um, the OECD conversations and be able to keep up, you know, but there hasn't been that global civil society support. And for me, the evidence is the fact that it wasn't even mentioned here, you know. So uh, I think I will just give a small solution. I think a good place to start is with the funders. Ford Foundation funded this. MacArthur Foundation has funded the report for the Nigeria country level illicit financial flows. Uh, I, I will not be here tomorrow, but Open Society Foundation has um, <coughs> a West African a branch, OSIWA, Open Society Initiative for West Africa. And all these foundations are funding research producing data, but there's no central coordination. You know, so you're having a duality of function, a duality of production of data, and you know, you're not having that multiply effect that we could have. You know, so uh, that's just my uh, recommendation because, you know, I see the effects of illicit finance on my people, you know, every day. So I take it very personally and I hope that you know, someone somewhere here will take this seriously and try to instigate that um, discussion. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Um, if, if you would do me the favor of um, touching base um, in one of our coffee breaks with my colleague, our program manager, Sarah Vaujois, um, we do actually um, have, we have worked very closely with coalition members um, on the Stop the Bleeding campaign, which is the, one of the responses to the UNECA report and also um, 
um, there's there's a bit of there's a bit of work there also on sort of country level estimates and stuff. So please, please. Um, uh, but we take up that challenge seriously. Other comments? I'm Terry Sprackland. I'm a reporter with Tax Analysts. And I had a question that I think would be most appropriate for Anders. On the country by country reporting, uh, there seems to be a lot of resistance because of uh, trade secrecy and, and uh, competition issues. Do you feel that that's uh, significant in, in holding this back, or, or is it really a smokescreen? And would it be better to, like as a first step, accept uh, that the information could be provided privately but not distributed uh, you know, to the public citizens? I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're bringing a trade-off between, say, companies that, that may not want to say where they're earning their money and getting all of the profits versus an integrity type goal, right? Um, and I sit on the integrity side, so I think the more you can do on the integrity side with transparency and so on, that would be fantastic. Um, we, we know that in developed countries with rule of law, the openness civil society will scrutinize is generally the approach, whereas in, 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 in countries with greater degree of corruption, there's more like data is hidden and, and then reviewed by by officials, right? I, I, I see that, right? So you can say, what is your confidence in the two approaches? So is it going to be effective? And who knows? It depends on the, the uh, country. I think, I think we need to throw it out to somebody who's more, more versed in this. Dev? Uh, <clears throat> my observation is that private gain is always offset by public loss. So one is the obverse of the other. Uh, and so when, when you're talking about private gain, multinationals, it's obviously a private gain, and they'd like to keep that. Because the loss is in the public sector, it's a public good. And the government, therefore, has to step in with appropriate regulation and oversight to minimize public loss. That's not a job that the private sector, that we can expect the private sector to self-police and somehow come up with a minimum private loss. Their, uh, th their objective is maximization of private gains by whatever means possible. So the, it, is the, it is incumbent upon the, the government to devise particular laws and oversight, effective oversight, to minimize that public loss and minimize the private gain. So uh, unless government's able to do that through appropriate policies and initiating dialogue, we are, we are going to continue to have this, this, this problem. So country by country reporting, yes, it is, it is of course, imposes an additional uh, burden on, on the private sector because they have to come up with this information. But that's not good enough if they, if they just balk against it. I mean, <laughs> they have, you know, uh, it, it, it will be painful for them uh, to uh, forego this private uh, gain. That's to be expected. When you get to the, yes, which I'm gonna... my, my name is Isaac Vatukpa Jr. Um, I'm representing the um, Development Brokers. It's a new NGO um, in Liberia. And I just want to make a point of correction first in terms of Dr. LaBelle's um, statement with regards to Madam Ellen Johnson Salif. I think, as most of you know, Liberia is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And, you know, she did have a great auditor, Mr. John Malou, but he they stopped at the audits. There were no real indictments, um, investigation, and prosecution. So, um, you know, that whole effort really has been undermined because she did get rid of him. Um, so, you know, just so people can be aware, we are asking the international community and people who donate funds to our country especially that there should be a higher demand for accountability, the impact and results from the funds they give, and transparency in the whole process. Um, the one thing I want to see if the two panelists up there can really push um, the intellectualization of this whole you know, um, illicit funds because I think there's two different concepts over there and how can we get to where we can kind of merge the two to get to where we really understand what really can we um, you know, unilaterally accept as the information 
that can be used in the analysis because we are trying to push an analysis in Liberia and we hope that we can have the right methodology, the right approach to use results that can impact our country. There is not two, but one. I, I don't think uh, Tamara and I uh, disagree on the, on, on the approach or on the database. Tamara is just pointing out, I think, uh, that you know, uh, the limitations of uh, balance of payments compilation in capturing illicit flows and what the methodology uh, recommends, the guidelines recommends, and that's what the IMF recommends to the member countries that they use uh, to capture these. But, so, but I'm saying that, I'm not saying, I'm not go, uh, questioning the methodology at all. I'm just saying that as far as misinvoicing goes, we use, we just try to keep it within the direction of trade statistics. So the question of a uh, comparison between direction of trade statistics and BOP and the balance payment does not arise. The only suggestion that I was thinking that, and, and apparently this may not be the correct way to approach, uh, given what Tamara said, is that the fund uh, uses a flat 10% of the cost of uh, freight and insurance, the CIF factor, uh, to take out 10% from, uh, from the imports and put it on the FOB basis. So you can compare export and imports on the same Taken out, taking out the cost of freight and insurance, and it's a flat 10%. So I was thinking that maybe instead of having a constant 10%, we can have some more realistic variation in the cost of freight and insurance by comparing the balance of payments uh, imports um, FOB with the uh, IFS imports CIF and divide one by the other and come up with a variable um, a CIF factor. Uh, but I think given the methodological that the, the issue that uh, Tamara has pointed out, uh, that's not going to be so easy. I think, am I right, Tamara? Yeah, you, yeah. Are, you are right. <laughs> like, there you have it, constructive dialogue already. No, no, but <laughs> but one, you have to re realize that Tamara is an expert in the balance of payments. She's a, she was a compiler. I do not have that kind of depth of knowledge in balance of payments compilation as Tamara has. Um, so, um, I'm very uh, grateful to you for pointing out these things. I mean, because yes, this is a, I could relate to it because re-exports uh, are are a, a significant issue, uh, which complica complicates this this calculation. Uh, but I I come from a more broader uh, experience as an economist, and so I'm able to use my macroeconomic background as well as statistical background and combine that and to to to, to apply that uh, broader experience. Uh, in this area. So it is, this area requires not just expertise in uh, narrow uh, you know, statistical issues, but also you have to go and look at the macroeconomics of, of things. So uh, one more question, and then we'll conclude. I'm Raymond Baker. Um, my question <laughs> <laughs> is directed to you, uh, Tamara. And I think there's something uh, very straightforward at issue here. And that is the difference between orders of magnitude on the one hand and exactitude uh, on the other hand. Um, we recognize that there can be errors in the trade data that we're dealing uh, with. Uh, globally, our estimate of illicit financial flows is a trillion dollars uh, a year out of developing countries. But more importantly, we think that that is very much on the low side and particularly because of the, the shortcomings in the trade data. Trade data, as Dev said, doesn't include cash movements, um, doesn't include uh, faking within the same invoice that is exchanged between buyers and sellers, and doesn't include any services and intangibles. So uh, as the high-level panel's uh, report on illicit financial flows from Africa indicated, we think that the figure could be twice what we can see uh, in the data. My question to you is, why is the IMF so reluctant to deal in orders of magnitude and, and chooses instead to take the position that in the face of what could be data uh, shortcomings, the answer is no analysis? Um, when, in fact, you do a great deal of analysis of GDP, uh, which can likewise have all of those uh, errors uh, in the same data. 
um, isn't that a, a selective interpretation of where you're willing to, uh, uh, to do the analysis and, uh, and where you're not willing to do the analysis? First of all, uh, statistics department, we are not doing the analysis. We are, we are building the data series. <laughs> there, are, there is research department, there are other departments in IMF that we are, they do the analysis and they come to some conclusions. I don't uh, know specifically analysis on illicit flows. I think that uh, research was the first one, but not by the IMF, which you are discussing. Uh, and first of all, I agree with you that the magnitude of illicit flows could be double, maybe triple even, because it comes not only from services, not only from goods, it could come only from uh, for interest received from by, by uh, multinationals, which is hidden in dividends and so on. It could come uh, through any other, uh, uh, many other uh, uh, ways. So uh, illicit flows can be uh, composed from, from different components. <laughs> uh, we are just stating that just taking statistics which are available now and comparing and making some conclusions, it's not enough and will not always will be a correct conclusion because taking, the, uh, let's say, taking errors and omissions in the balance of payments. We cannot say that errors and omissions indicate illicit flows. Errors and omissions, first of all, we mm -hmm. uh, define that these are statistical uh, mm -hmm. shortcomings, statistical inconsistencies that uh, sometimes we are capturing one, we are not comparing only within goods. Let's say balance of payments capture flows, physical flows and payments for these flows. It could be that we are capturing goods but we are not capturing uh, the balancing entry which is a payment. Or we are capturing services and we are not capturing goods. That's why uh, it's from here errors and omissions include apart from illicit flows in at which level illicit flows could in, be included in errors and omissions at the level if one country captured this flow another another country do not capture it so if you compare at the, at the global level so errors and omissions consist not only of illicit flows it has many other components yeah. and it it's not right to, to to attribute it in just to to illicit flows you have to go to micro level, to micro analysis, to be uh, sure that it's, uh, you capture correctly and make uh, correct uh, conclusions of, from here. Why uh, IMF uh, doesn't conduct more analysis on this? On this, I, I cannot <laughs> say this because it's not in my... Uh, there are some analysis, but not in statistic department. Statistic department has a task to build and to have more or less reliable, consistent, and a comparative time series of data for all member countries. And to come to some figures at global level, to identify some global discrepancies, and to dig further and to try to, 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 to reduce these global discrepancies by improving data of each country. So I want to thank our panelists for their insights and their conversation, and thank you for your great questions. Okay, thank you.